how do you help somebody who has these migraine headaches that are debilitating heal that pain? What we do with pain reprocessing is teaching people to react to their pain differently. So sometimes it's with distraction. You know, if you're in a lot of pain, maybe you just let yourself take that nap or watch a show or read a book or something that's distracting. And so we, I try to get people to notice times in their lives that the pain has been a little bit less when they're doing something they enjoy. And so people will often say like, okay, my pain is pretty constant, but once I went on vacation and for three days I didn't have pain, or you know, when I was talking to my friends over lunch, I noticed my headache was gone. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Flip Your Mindset. I'm your host, Stacey Urig, and I'm back with Betsy Jensen. And if you didn't listen to my last interview with Betsy, you're going to just get the link to the show notes, um, link to the podcast in the show notes. But basically, Betsy and I were having this really great conversation about how the mind and body are connected, how our nervous system, when it's activated, can really cause so many ailments in our body. And if they don't make sense, that should be a piece of information for you. But as we were getting towards the end of that interview, Betsy started talking about pain reprocessing. And I really just wanted to tap back in with her, bring her back on and talk about what that is. So welcome back. Thanks, Stacey. Good to be here. Yeah. So you talked about pain reprocessing in the last interview in the last uh, episode, what is pain reprocessing? Okay, great question. So fundamentally, as a physical therapist, 20 years ago, I was taught that pain meant that there was tissue damage. But we know that the brain is what produces pain in the body. So even if I have a cut on my finger, my brain interprets the level of danger of that and can send pain there. And when there is tissue damage, the pain that it sends is appropriate and it's telling us to get medical help. And if we have a broken arm, go get it fixed. Or there was this one man who was a construction worker and he stepped on a nail that went through his boot and he got incredible pain. They had to sedate him to cut his boot off and they found that that his skin was actually not even punctured. It went right through his toe area He didn't even have a scratch on him, but his brain had interpreted that situation as dangerous and that he needed to stop walking on it and get medical help. And so his brain produced intense pain to get him, you know, to get the help he needed. And it turns out there was no tissue injury at all. So that's Yeah, it like it blew my mind. I had no idea. Because like I said, I've worked with people in pain. I've been trained as a physical therapist. I thought I knew a lot about pain. But this completely changed my mind. I just we just haven't known since until they've done a lot of neuroscience research recently, that the brain is what creates pain all pain, very real pain. So when people say the doctor said it was all in my head, like I hate that term because it just doesn't even make sense. The mind and body are not separate. So that's the biggest thing to just know with pain reprocessing therapy. The reason why it can work is because the brain doesn't really have an accurate um, display of pain to reflect how much tissue damage is there. And sometimes we think, well, there's so much pain, there must be really something structural going on. And it turns out that there isn't. Or, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, speaking of so many of my clients right now, because how many clients do you see that have specifically like neck pain and migraine pain? Mm -hmm. And they go through scans, they go through MRIs, they have all of the diagnostic tests done. The doctors say, there's nothing wrong with you because I'm not seeing anything on the scan. They're feeling powerless and hopeless because they're in debilitating, their words, not mine, pain. And the pain for them is very real. There's no denying that. It is real pain. Um, but yeah. there's no evidence of anything that should be causing the pain. So then it makes them feel, and I'm again putting in quotes, crazy yeah. or broken, which leaves yeah. them feeling powerless and hopeless, which are also massive emotions. So yes, 
what do you do? I'm assuming you see people that have these kind of neck pains and um, migraine pain. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So how can you help someone? I really want to focus on the migraine because I really hear about this a lot. How do you help somebody who has these migraine headaches that are debilitating heal that pain? How do you help mm-hmm. them resolve this pain? Yeah. So the the first thing to really understand is that the brain will they they there is this pain fear cycle. And so when you have pain and then you react to it with fear, it actually amplifies the pain. So it's like a a knob turning up the pain when we react with fear or with frustration or with really focusing on it urgently trying to fix it, which are normal reactions to pain. Normally we do focus on it because it feels like it's consuming. It's such a threat. We have to focus on it. And usually people focus on it with fear, especially when they're told we can't find what's wrong with you. That induces a lot of fear. So a lot of time the, the medical system actually induces more fear and more pain. And what we do with pain reprocessing is teaching people to react to their pain differently. So sometimes it's with distraction. You know, if you're in a lot of pain, Maybe you just let yourself take that nap or watch a show or read a book or something that's distracting. And so we, I try to get people to notice times in their lives that the pain has been a little bit less when they're doing something they enjoy. And so people will often say like, okay, my pain is pretty constant, but once I went on vacation and for three days, I didn't have pain. Or, you know, when I was talking to my friends over lunch, I noticed my headache was gone. But then when I went back home, it was there again. So we're used to just looking for the pain and resisting it. So what I teach people is the opposite, like look for the variations, look for the times that when your emotions are good and you're feeling good, that your body feels good too. And by the education of just knowing what's going on and knowing these are neural pathways that create pain and, and they could be activated by real, you know, structural things, or they could be activated, sorry, activated by emotion, Mm -hmm. right? So we just know the pain in the emotional area of the brain, they use the same neural circuits. And that's why we can, when we have heartache, we can really feel this pain in our heart, right? We can feel pain in our chest. So it's a lot of education. And then the approach when there is pain to treating it differently. So sending messages of safety, you're okay, you know, especially the case where someone has had all the scans, and there's nothing structurally causing it. That's a, that's a little easier way to say, okay, I am safe. There's this sensation that is really disturbing. But it's kind of like a a Wim Hof bath, you know, the ice bath, you can have a really strong sensation, but you can breathe through it and you can um, calm your nervous system through it. And then that reaction is less and less each time. I like the fact that you use the term sensation because I even see mm-hmm. this, if it's not physical pain, emotional pain. If somebody comes into my office or we're doing it on Zoom and they said, I've been swimming through anxiety or I'm having a panic uh. attack you know, for the last two days. And I will always say, okay, without sounding like I'm being, you know, dismissive, because I'm not, I just want you to tell me, how do you know that? How do you Mm -hmm. know that you're having a panic attack, or that you're having an anxiety attack? What does it feel Mm -hmm. like to you? Yes. Right? And then they'll say, yes. I have a heaviness in my chest. I'm having a hard time taking a full breath. I feel like I have a pit in my stomach. I feel like my throat is constricted. They might feel that their face is hot or that, you know, their arms feel pinched or hot or they tense. And so I get mm-hmm. them to start to share physiologically, because really to me, anxiety is a visceral reaction, right? It's an activation. Yes, absolutely. And then yeah. I say to them, okay. If you're telling yourself, because you're telling me, I'm having a panic attack, I'm having an anxiety attack, associated with that is some level of story from a negative connotation, because it's something Mm -hmm. you don't want, correct? 
Yeah, we, we don't want to feel it. Yeah. yeah so totally. nothing positively associated with telling yourself I'm in panic or I'm anxiety. But how does it mm-hmm. feel inside your nervous system if you were just to say, I'm having an activation in my nervous system? Yes. And they're like, yeah. it's definitely smaller. And I was like, okay. Yeah. So tell me about this activation that you're having in your nervous system. So they'll tell me and I'll say, when did that activation start? And to your point from our previous interview, well, I got this email. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you got this email and you had this activation. What did the email say? They said this. And how does that affect you? Well, I'm worried that this is going to happen. And how does that affect you? And then we go through the worry. We go through the fear and we get to this little root, right? Or I had a client recently who's been struggling in relationship and she read a book by Dr. Romani. So if anybody knows Dr. Romani, she specializes in narcissism. And she said, can a book make me throw up? Hmm. Yeah. And I said, well, the book cannot make you throw up, but how you were feeling when you were reading the book could definitely make you feel like you need to throw up or could yeah. cause you to vomit if you're activated in such a way So what were you feeling and thinking while you were reading this book, right? So Mm -hmm. it's really important for people to understand even what you tell yourself. So I'm thinking for my clients with migraines, the more they focus on, I have a migraine, Mm -hmm. it's just like the anxiety. There's nothing positive that you're telling me about that. Right. You don't want a migraine. A migraine is not associated with anything other than debilitating pain, which we would label as not positive or pleasant. Mm -hmm. The more you tell this to your body, the more you're going to sit in this cycle. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. And the more we're resisting it, the more we're trying to push it away and force it down and not have it. And we get really upset if a little bit comes back. Oh, I started to have an aura. Oh no. You know, and we get really worked up about it. It just strengthens those neural pathways and same with anxiety. Oh, I've got to figure this out and there's this and this and anxiety can feel so real. And, you know, kind of like one thing, like I use this example, when when COVID hit and my job went remote, I suddenly had all this time on my hands and I started noticing the closets that needed to be cleaned out and the baseboards that hadn't been dusted, right? So my anxiety didn't go away just because the circumstance changed. I just found new things to worry about. And that's why we want to just when we can go into the somatics, the sensation of the anxiety, when we can describe it, we can teach our brain this is misinformation, just like mm-hmm. pain often is, then we can react to it differently. And our brain does produce it less and less. So it's like, you know, training Pavlov's dogs, apparently he trained them to salivate and he untrained them to hear the bell and not salivate. So that's kind of the end we're working on is like unlearning this response that anytime there's a trigger, I go into this anxiety and that's going to help me feel safer. No, it doesn't. Well, it's it just, funny because you know, it's like get more and more adaptive thing that then becomes maladaptive very quickly, right? At yes. some point you needed it yes. in a moment yes. and it worked. Yeah. And so now exactly. anything that feels like it, that's like our automatic response. Right. And and like we were saying in the last episode, like these nervous system responses are good. We want to have them. If there's a threat and a tiger chasing me, I do want to go into flight. But if I'm sitting in my office and sending an email, I don't want to go Listen, into flight. <laughs> my husband and I went through this really tough experience over a five year period of time. And without getting into details, both of him and I, when we get an email from certain types of institutions, we both have a visceral panic reaction in our body. Yes. Both of us were having it separately and we weren't saying anything to the other person. And then it came up over dinner one night and he said, do you think we have PTSD? And I said, I kind mm. of do, yes, from my from the trauma informed seat, yes. And yeah. what that really means is we had we were feeling very specific things when we were in battle for years and years and years with these certain kinds of organizations. 
And mm-hmm. now our body's been trained to believe that there can't be anything other than a battled situation with these organizations. And so any yeah. single time you see, you haven't even you opened the email yet. There's an yeah. email from the institution or from someone re- associated with the institution yeah. in your inbox. For me, yeah. it was a split second immediate from the throat all the way down to the sacrum, back up into my stomach and sits in my chest in like a mm-hmm. nanosecond. And I don't yes. get that from anything else or from anyone else. It was a, it was yeah. almost like um, a specific ringtone you might have on your phone for a specific person. It was a specific mm-hmm. reaction in my nervous system for a specific mm-hmm. circumstance. And yeah. I've had to train my body to just even open up my my personal inbox for fear yeah. that I would see something. And what I yeah. do is similar to what you've said, which is I'm going to go open my personal email and mm-hmm. I'm safe no matter whose yeah. name is in my inbox. Yeah. I am safe. That is an old feeling that was necessary yeah. in the moment. Cause sometimes I needed mm-hmm. that bolt of adrenaline Mm -hmm. through what I needed to do in those five years, but I don't need it anymore. But yeah, I know what I know. How many people do I have that come in that say I was triggered by an email? I was triggered by a scent. I was triggered by somebody looking at me a certain way. Really what we're saying is I experienced something that left me feeling in a way that I didn't know how to process that emotion. I had Mm -hmm. to activate in order to negate the emotion at the time. Mm -hmm. which was adaptive and smart. And now we're well beyond it. And I'm still reacting the same way. Yeah. And generally the nervous system then starts to even get more reactive to anything, right? You know, it could start with um, it's when I see that name on the email and then it goes to, I just see there's an email to open and I get it or I pick up my phone and I get it. And so that's generally what happens with pain as well. Um, You know, pains can start just in one part and then there's this fear of movement and pain starts happening in other parts of the body. And it, it maybe makes a little more sense when we're talking about anxiety and emotions coming up, but just like that, just like you could get anxiety from seeing that email, someone could get back pain from thinking about a a, um, conversation with someone that was unpleasant. So certain parts of our bodies, um, it can tighten up those muscles in those parts. And a lot of times we just think, okay, well, if it's emotional, that's coming from the brain or whatever, that makes sense. But, but I have like a real shoulder problem. I have a torn labrum or something. And I wanted to touch on this when you were talking about, you know, some people have had a lot of scans and a lot of diagnostic procedures and not found anything. But what's really cool too, is we're finding that they've done a lot of research on healthy, pain-free people. And they've found that there are just normal abnormalities as we age. So like 50% of 40 year olds that are not in pain, if they did an MRI on them, they'll see a bulging disc. Oh my God. I knew you were just going to say that. And this is amazing, right? Yes. This blew my mind. Like, I just thought, okay, if you have something structural, that's going to cause you pain. But first of all, we're realizing pain can be created without that structural thing. And some people have that structural exact thing and don't have chronic pain. So I found one study that was studying young, healthy athletes. So they're young, they're athletic, and not in pain. And 89% of them had a hip labral tear. We just aren't studying people who are aren't in pain. We don't do MRIs of healthy people usually unless they're doing oh, research. You're giving me a chill. Isn't that crazy? So sometimes when, um, you know, sometimes like a client had Morton's neuroma, it's like a pain in the foot that they say is from a nerve being compressed. So I looked up like, can Morton's neuroma ever occur without pain? And they there was luckily one study where they did autopsies on people who didn't have pain and 10% of them had a Morton's neuroma. So it's, it gets really crazy. I mean, it gets it really can. confusing. And, and but go into a whole other, you know, episode, but I, I had a situation 
three or four years ago where I had excruciating pain in my shoulder. There was mm-hmm. nothing there. Okay. But mm-hmm. not only was the pain pretty extreme, but my, my range of motion was very much affected. It's mm-hmm. very, very much affected. And so I started going to, um, originally I thought in my mind, oh, something's kind of stuck. So I was going to a massage therapist that does myofascial release, which if anybody's ever had myofascial release, I've had it many times. It can feel like medieval torture and they will mm-hmm. say, I'm barely touching you. And I'm like, I want mm-hmm. to jump off the table <laughs> and mm-hmm. vomit. I'm in so much pain. I did myofascial release for many, you know, deep tissue massage. I went and got x-rays and MRIs. There was nothing there. They recommended that I go for PT. I'm going to PT. Nothing's helping. Nothing's helping. And I was telling a good friend of mine, I have so many friends that are deeply intuitive. And I was talking to one of my friends about it. And she, her name is Chitra. And she said, well, did you go see RT, which is another friend of ours? And I said, no. She goes, well, I had hip problems and I did the same thing you did and nothing was resolving it. And I went to RT and she helped me. And I was like, well, I'll do anything at this point. Cause it had been like six months. So mm-hmm. I, I meet with my friend RT and RT is very spiritually aligned. She's very connected and she, like I does hypnosis, but she does hypnosis. There's so many different ways to do hypnotherapy and our ways are very different. So I went to her and I said, I hear you can help me. And she's like, well, let's see. And so she did a piece of hypnosis with me that allowed me to kind of like go inward and investigate my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And it was like, she put me in this like little capsule and I kind of like imagined myself like kind of floating. And I'll be honest with you. I don't remember everything that happened, but what I do remember is somehow I'm visualizing in this part of my shoulder that I'm sitting around a campfire with my grandfather and my mother. That's Mm -hmm. And whatever was said Mm -hmm. within two weeks, that pain left. It has never Mm -hmm. come back. My range of motion has never been the same and I definitely need to get that better, but the pain was gone. And what she was saying to me is there was an emotional wound that Mm -hmm. I had that basically had traveled to this part of my body and was keeping Mm -hmm. me locked. Mm -hmm. And when she was able to help me heal the emotional wound, that pain Mm -hmm. went away. Yes. Yeah. And what you described, I would imagine is that safe state where you're by the campfire with some of your she favorite said, people, pick someone who you feel yeah. the most safe with that's either alive yeah. or past. And I picked my grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, having that, like, cause sometimes people think like, well, what is it I need to do or say to myself or think, but it's really the feeling. If you can change the feeling, the pain can go away. And I have a quick example of this, if you don't mind, because it's so cool. This just happened with one of my clients. She had had this pain that she went to the hospital once for, and they gave her some some pills, some tablets that really worked for it. And so as she's been doing this mind body work, she's had some other pains and stuff. That one wasn't as common, but she was stressed and that certain pain came back and she decided, well, you know, I always have those tablets. I can just go take them. That's fine. I'll just do that. So she goes and just puts them in her hand and just having them in her hand, her pain went away. Isn't that amazing? The placebo. Yeah. Because she had gotten to the, she had changed states from a fear-based state of, oh, here's this pain. What if it gets worse? What if I have to go to the hospital again to like, okay, I know what to do. I'm going to take this action. I have it. And she got to the safe state and just by, she didn't even have to take the pill, but she changed her nervous system state and her pain went away. We could talk for hours. It's yeah, like amazing. Yeah, it's just, and it's you know, easy. Look, yeah, you and I, I are it. in this space all the time. And I'm sure for a listener, there's some information here to be absorbed. It might sound a little far fetched. It might sound, you know, not doable, doable. I can't say what anybody would feel, but I can understand how someone might listen to this, especially somebody that maybe has been dealing with a lot of pain, a lot of chronic pain. 
um, yeah. that might either be intrigued or turned off by the conversation. Yeah, but for sure. My goal always with the podcast is educate and give people different lenses through which to see their biggest challenges in life. And like I said, in the last episode, I've known Betsy for a long time. We were brought together, I think by Gretchen Hernandez, maybe. Is that right? Oh, yeah. That sounds right. right? Yeah. Through Brooke Castillo and all of that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's been a few years that I've known Betsy yeah. and we've been in and out, in and out. And I've been following her on Instagram and I highly recommend if this topic speaks to you that you follow Betsy on Instagram and all of that will be in the show notes, but just really learning and listening about how our mind and body are connected, how they can have a massive impact on our health. And, um, I'm just telling you right now, my dogs are going apeshit crazy. Which means <laughs> that my next client is probably here and is early, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to wrap it up, but guys, if this is of interest to you, all of the information about Betsy and the work that she does are going to be in the show notes. Just give them the uh, website really quick. Yeah. My website is bodyandmindlifecoach.com. Awesome. Guys, I'd keep going, but the client is here. So Betsy, thank you so much. Thank you, Stacy. That was so fun. Yes. And everybody, again, if you love this podcast, subscribe so you can be notified whenever the next cast is dropped. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks.